So we have another great topic coming up next. It's titled Mind the Gap with Shaliza Sajwani. So Salija is an ovarian cancer survivor and an oncology pharmacist working at the Ottawa Hospital. Uh, she's experienced in both outpatient and inpatient oncology. And along with working in oncology, she's currently subspecializing in palliative care and has a deep passion for focusing medication management on patient-centered goals, priorities, and values. Uh, understanding information that's shared during appointments helps to build trust between patients and their healthcare providers. So Shaliza will share with us tonight some tips that will help you comprehend the clinical information being shared with you so you can feel confident and supported along your journey. So enough from me, over to you, Shaliza. Thank you so much. It's uh, lovely to meet all of you. Um, I will just share my screen. Um, I have some very informal slides, um, but I'm hoping that we will have some great time for questions as well. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to interacting with with all of you. So I will share my screen now. Okay. So um, I did have some problems with slides lagging behind with a separate presentation today. So um, if uh, the staff at Ovarian Cancer Canada, if you can let me know if there's any um, issues with uh, the slides kind of being parallel with my voice. <laughs> um, and I'll make sure that I, I slow down so that the, the, the slides basically catch up. Um, so the, the topic of my presentation today is Mind the Gap. And uh, for those of you who have uh, heard of the term mind the gap, um, if you've ever been to England, um, when, you, when you're going on a tube uh, the, or the subway system, there's something in the background saying mind the gap between the train and the platform. Um, but here we're actually thinking about mind the gap between um, the perspectives and the thinking of patients and their healthcare professionals. And um, the reason why I'm presenting today is to try to um, bridge that gap. Um, I have also done presentations for healthcare professionals as well. Um, based on my time um, as a patient, I, I still go for, for follow-up um, appointments. So I'm not at that five-year uh, mark. Um, but I, as, a, as an oncology pharmacist, um, I basically go for my follow-ups and I also do uh, presentations to my colleagues and to others, um, basically about how to think about um, values and, and priorities of patients when um, interacting uh, with patients on a day-to-day -day basis. But today we're here for you. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, I spent five years, um, I have five years of experience as an outpatient oncology pharmacist and uh, two years of experience as an inpatient oncology pharmacist. Um, when I was a month shy of my 31st birthday, so I was 30 years old, um, I was suddenly diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Um, and I um, had a sudden ovarian torsion, um, which revealed a 12 centimeter mass in my abdomen. Um, staging wasn't clear right away, but later on I, I found out that I um, had a 1C clear cell, half part clear cell, part endometrioid uh, ovarian cancer. And um, I was treated by my colleagues um, and I went through the process like many of you. I, I, uh, I went through carboplatin and paclitaxel like a lot of you may have experienced. And um, in 2019, um, after a full radical hysterectomy, I went into remission. Um, and I know for those of you who are in remission, I know I, I understand um, what happens in the time after remission with regards to um, managing and, and trying to figure out um, your new path. Um, I have been now three years in remission, um, but um, I can safely say that ovarian cancer has um, completely uh, changed my life. Um, about two years ago, I returned as an oncology pharmacist and I switched to inpatient oncology. Um, so I see cancer patients on a regular basis. Um, and uh, I also have subspecialized in palliative care. Um, so 
I just wanted to let you know my background. Um, and this is a photo of me once I've just finished all of my treatment, as well as um, this was basically during my, my, uh, my last surgery, so my first day of remission. Um, so I wanted to basically thank um, a few individuals, uh, an individual from Cancer Care Manitoba, a psychologist, and um, individuals from Young Adult Cancer Canada who helped me with regards to um, getting uh, some information. I'm an oncology pharmacist, but some of this information comes from the, uh, the, the psychology lens as well and social worker lens. So I um, thought I'd ask you today um, to reflect on what are your priorities as, as to, um, you know, what, what is important to you while you're going through your treatment? Um, do you feel that your values and your priorities are being respected while you go through treatment and, uh, or even if you're not in treatment? Um, and do you feel supported in that path? Uh, do you know how to communicate your values? Um, so are you a participant in the process? So um, when you are discussing with your physician, is it, a, is it more of a kind of instruction that the physician basically or the healthcare provider tells you that you have to do X, Y, Z? Um, or is it kind of like a dialogue, um, a, a back and forth kind of dialogue when you're, when you're discussing with your, with your provider? Um, and um, the same can be asked of supporters as well, uh, people who are supporting individuals who are going through um, ovarian cancer, um, who are, who are um, you know, family members or friends, um, are you noticing that your, um, that your uh, family members' values, for example, are, are being, are being uh, respected and are their values being respected? Um, so why is this happening? So before, uh, while I, I'll backtrack a bit by saying that um, sometimes there can be, um, there are studies that show some form of systemic bias that exists within the healthcare system. So for example, um, if someone is very young, then there could be that thinking that, oh, this person is very young, they don't know, perhaps know their values or know their priorities. Or if they're a lot older, they, there may be some thinking that this person can't manage their, like, um, by, by maybe their, their, their some kind of assumption about absent-mindedness or, um, or infantilizing that can sometimes happen with ageism. Um, the patient-provider relationship is also an interesting one. So, um, years and years ago, um, I would say yeah, years and years, 20 years ago, um, the idea was that the patient provider relationship should have been more of a paternalistic type relationship where the physician or the healthcare provider is the one that basically, you know, is the one that, that has all the power and the patient is the dependent. So therefore the patient follows what the provider has to say. And it's not, there wasn't as much patient involvement in uh, decision-making. And now in med schools, um, they're teaching a more horizontal type relationship. So um, you are able to, um, in theory, the way that it's taught, you're, you're supposed to be able to, to express your, your values, your priorities, what you think while you are interacting with uh, your provider so that they can understand what your values and priorities are. And this is particularly relevant in palliative care, although not exclusive to palliative care. Um, so things are changing, um, but they're not, it, it, change doesn't happen overnight. Um, so it's moving in that direction, but um, we need educational presentations such as these um, to help move it in the right direction. Uh, there can be other factors too. Um, so there's uh, data about systemic racism, for example, that also exists. Um, so if you think about um, the, the data that has come out about about indigenous how how um, patients have felt if they are if they are indigenous and they're maneuvering a, a healthcare system that is not completely um, built around their their needs as well um, and and their cultures um, there, and there can be some some other. Uh, some some other factors as well that can influence both systemic bias as well as um, how the healthcare system is structured. 
Um, provider and patient trust is a big one. Uh, there was one study that showed that, um, you know, it takes an average of 29 seconds for, for somebody to mention their priorities. Okay. However, um, they, it took an average of 11 seconds before they were interrupted by a healthcare provider. So um, maybe you've heard the words, um, it's all in your head, maybe you're just anxious. Um, so these are, are things that can affect um, issues with regards to systemic bias um, as well. Particularly, I mean, ovarian cancer is a, is a generally female um, illness. So um, this can also intersect with some unconscious sexism as well. So um, the good cancer, um, not really a phrase that's mentioned about ovarian cancer, but certainly if you have a, if you're, if you are one of the minority that is diagnosed early, um, you will be told that, oh, you know, you are, you are like, you are, oh, don't worry, you're very lucky, or you have a good cancer or something like that, when really no cancer is really good. Um, so everything is all kind of comparative. Um, I was told a lot um, that, uh, that I was very lucky for having an, a, a relatively early stage cancer. Um, but of course, most of my colleagues who are 30, 31 or so are, 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 are relative, my age were relatively healthy. Um, so, so all of this, the good cancer is kind of, it's, it, it's a tough, uh, tough phrase to use. Uh, the spiel while counseling. So you may be taught about your side effects and you may be told that, oh, um, treatment can cause X, Y, Z uh, side effect, but is it a, really a dialogue versus is it a back and forth conversation? Um, and again, are there good or bad cancers? Why are you struggling if it's a good cancer or if it's an early stage? Um, this can be particularly difficult when uh, you add survivor's guilt there because you may be having friends with individuals who um, have, who have um, either passed away or are diagnosed more later or have experienced a recurrence. I know I, I have many friends who, uh, who have advanced disease. Um, and um, it's very important to, to realize that each person has has their own um, has their own path, so we should not be using uh, that kind of terminology. Some other things. Um, so sometimes uh, the diagnosis can be very sudden, and you're given so much information at the same time. Information overload, and you also have emotional overload from the from from what is being told to you, um, and what. Certain things you can do to kind of help manage that is first um, having someone with you. Um, sometimes this can be challenging with COVID, um, but even having someone on the phone um, sometimes helps. Um, I used to keep a notebook with me um, because people assume that because I was a professional, um, I would never get overloaded. Um, but you know, when your mortality is kind of brought to your to your eyes at a very unexpected time. Um, and there's so many things in the air, you will get overloaded. Um, and so I found it was helpful to plan my questions in advance, to write my questions in a notebook, uh, one spot for questions, one spot for answers, and then just basically go through my questions at the appointment. Um, and that that I found particularly helpful. Um, it's we're, there's a lot that's also being uh, that's that's taking place in 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 med med school and in other um, other professional schools about being seen as a person versus the patient. So um, so for example, empathy versus sympathy. Um, it's important when when you realize that you have someone who is empathizing with you, it can make a world of a difference with regards to the conversation with healthcare professionals. And there's a lot of dialogue that happens with regards to, there's a lot of conversations that can be have that can happen with regards to empathy versus sympathy. And then of course, cancer recurrence. Um, well, I know there's a lot of information that was talked about about cancer recurrence. Um, one thing to, to keep in mind with regards to communicating with your healthcare provider if you, for example, you're experiencing symptoms that you feel that are worrisome for recurrence and uh, your provider asks, um, you know, are you sure you're not just anxious because cancer can increase your risk of, of depression and anxiety? One way to, to respond back would be, um, I, I know how normal anxiety feels like or how my normal depressive symptoms feel like if you have gone through depressive symptoms, but this feels different. Um, and that's a way to be able to communicate to say that 
you know, um, it, it, it's this is not something that is quote unquote in my head. Um, so similar to to uh, questions about nausea or pain, um, you can you can answer questions in, in these types of ways. But one thing to realize is that this is these are system issues. These are not individual healthcare provider issues. These are not um, patient related issues. This is not a problem that is because of you. Um, these are systemic issues that. Um, take some time to resolve, but get better with education. Um, so this is a slide I, I often keep with, uh, with when I'm talking to healthcare providers, just moving towards from empathy to compassion. But um, one thing I wanted to uh, talk about with you is to think about, you know, first, of course, we want to think about whether the healthcare provider has empathy and compassion for yourself, moving from pity and sympathy to empathy and compassion, seeing you as a person. But also, um, how do you see yourself? Um, so when you're able to have empathy for yourself, um, you can kind of, and have compassion for yourself, um, you're a lot more um, understanding and you kind of give yourself a break a little bit more. Um, it's the difference between, for example, um, saying that, oh, I have something that I'd like to improve on versus um, I am bad and I'm worthless and I am just a patient now and nothing else is, uh, nothing else, nothing can be done in the sense that my whole personality has left me. Um, this is something that we often go through when, during diagnosis in the sense that um, you can feel like your personality is leaving, but you are still you. You just also have cancer and that will affect aspects of your personality, but you still have, you are still you with cancer. So it's a good idea to think about how can you incorporate self-compassion with that by figuring out how to incorporate um, adjustments to your day-to-day -day lifestyle um, while also seeking out psychosocial supports. Um, you to your healthcare provider. So um, that's not one that's thought of uh, often, but um, but of course, healthcare professionals were also kind of um, really burnt out by COVID and um, are very, very short staffed right now. So that is also an area that um, that we can, we can think about too. Um, of course, it's a very sensitive area because a lot of us um, have sometimes experienced um, not enough um, on the vice versa. So it's it's sometimes hard uh, to think about yourself to healthcare professionals, but it may be good to start with, in your mind, start with a healthcare provider who has been very good to you and, and who has uh, been more empathetic and then start there and then start thinking about the other healthcare professionals after that, um, because that will be a little bit easier on, um, on yourself as well. So um, what motivates you? Um, one quote I uh, got from a uh, Young Adult Cancer Canada individual uh, was that they are concerned about uh, whether I live or not, but they're not concerned about whether the cancer destroys who I am. So um, it's a good idea to understand what actually motivates you. What are your priorities? What are your values? So for example, um, a lot of the um, young adults that I, I talk to, um, a lot of their priorities were um, their, their exams, their relationship, their, their ships, their work, um, sometimes fertility. Um, sometimes if uh, it may be that neuropathy is, for example, a side effect that you cannot, um, like it would be very, very disruptive to your, to your life because of certain activities that you feel fulfill you as a person. Um, perhaps it's time with your grandchildren or your children um, that uh, that that fee make you feel uh, fulfilled. Uh, but it's important to have an idea and explore what motivates you and what are your priorities. And if you can write these down, you can actually um, also be able to you can also communicate these um, with your provider as well. Um, you can also then deal with team assumptions. So, for example. Um, a team may assume that either you are um, you you are willing to go through any treatment despite any uh, adverse effect consequence, or they may assume the opposite that you know you you should um, or you 
you uh, you may want to to stop therapy at a at a particular treatment in a point in time, but really they can give you the advice, they can give you the data, but really it is your life and um, it's these are your values and your priorities. So um, you can basically um, start writing down what are your values, what are your goals, and share those with your family, and then also share those um, with your healthcare provider as well to prevent them from uh, making assumptions which they, they shouldn't, but um, we can we can give them a little bit of a break because sometimes they sometimes there are knowledge gaps in those areas. Um, how do you communicate your values? Um, so we so one thing to think about, you can um, so we often talk about goals of care in uh, in the healthcare professional world as to what are the goals of care? Is it full treatment? Is it comfort care? But instead, uh, in the patient world, we can think about what are our goals of living? What does successful treatment look like for you? And what does a successful life in your circumstance look for you? So for example, if um, you have a dire prognosis um, in those four or five months or in those six months or in that year, what do you want to prioritize within that, peri uh, that, that period of time? Um, so these are, I have a couple of examples that are non-ovarian cancer specific, um, but uh, you have, for example, a 20-year-old woman, um, this could easily be a stage 1C um, ovarian cancer or 1B ovarian cancer, and her priorities are to um, finish her art degree and keep painting. Um, neuropathy might be something that she's very worried about. Um, case two, um, another person with metastatic uh, ovarian cancer, I'll just say, and she wants to spend time with her five-year-old child. And that is the thing that gives her um, gives her the most fulfillment. So that might influence the, the lines of the amount of lines of therapy that she pursues. Um, so it's one can basically then talk to the staff to say, you know, this this is what is important to me. These are my values and this is what's important to me. And also have that conversation with your uh, friends and family as well. Um, you can move around uh, to different providers if you feel that one is not necessarily um, understanding your priorities or your or your values. Um, and uh, sometimes um, it's not even about understanding. Uh, it's It's just about how you know, you fit well. Um, so for example, while I was going through treatment, um, I was looking for someone uh, as, an, as someone who had an oncology pharmacist background who would feel comfortable discussing clinical trials with me. Um, and some providers do not feel comfortable discussing clinical trials with patients, which is totally understandable. Um, but that's what I was looking for during treatment. After treatment, um, I was looking for someone who had more experience in, in survivorship, for example, um, because a lot of providers have less experience with regards to, to survivorship specifically. So different providers have different strengths. Um, you can also do the same with regards to a pharmacist, a social worker, a nurse. If you have a particular nurse that you would really like, you can express that to your clerk. Um, you can mention that to a booking clerk with regards to a physician. Um, however, once you find one that you you think is really works work well for you. Um, trying to stick with that one is helpful because that person then has a better idea of, um, of, your, of your history. Of course, there are notes in the system that should provide each professional with, um, with the inf relevant information, but sometimes it's helpful for provider-patient relationships if you can stick with one. In some centers, unfortunately, they have a rotating system, so it's difficult to kind of stick with one. Um, but, uh, and in that case, I would recommend having all of the, your, your information kind of ready at hand if you can. Um, if you, if not, um, the notes should be, should be in the system. Um, choosing a pharmacy, um, I would try to stick with a com one community pharmacy as well, um, because um, the community pharmacist also kind of does their own interactions check and, uh, and you can build a relationship with the community pharmacist as well. Don't be afraid of asking for a second opinion um, from, from anyone on first diagnosis. Um, you know, people are human. Uh, you can ask for ask for second opinions. It's your life. Um, and uh, and it, it, don't let people tell you that no, no, this is the box and you must um, you must follow X, Y, Z. Um, so feel free to 
feel free to give to ask for a second opinion if you feel like that also um, will help you and give you peace of mind. Um, family doctors, um, family doctors are under underestimated. Uh, people think so. The oncologists are focused on the cancer. Uh, family doctors are thinking about you as a whole with regards to um, other comorbidity, um, other illnesses that you may have. Um, treating the side effects, for example, of your of your illness. Um, and it's important to keep your family doctor updated. It's it becomes even more important um, after if you're somebody who um, you have finished uh, six cycles of chemo, for example, and now um, you're on uh, like you're being followed up every three months, for example, regardless of your staging. Um, your family doctor can often be a really big advocate for you as well once you're experiencing symptoms at, uh, at different points. Um, so I, I had an excellent family doctor that I was very lucky to have um, who really helped me with chronic care and survivorship. Um, a lot of cancer centers also have a patient support line who you can, uh, which you can call for um, to mention that you have X, Y, Z symptoms and uh, they're staffed by nurses and they will basically triage you to the right, um, right place. Um, you can ask your nurse and physician as well. Um, some provinces have their own um, separate private kind of support lines as well. Um, so there are also external programs, for example, um, Inspire Health in BC, uh, sees patients um, as well, including, uh, and they have doctors and dietitians, nurses as well. Um, I want to underline the importance of psychosocial. Um, I think it's so underestimated. And um, a lot of the time you won't get a referral to psychosocial unless um, unless a, a, a provider can visibly tell that you are quite distressed. Um, with a lot of us, um, you know, we go into our, our appointments and we really look like we know what we're doing. And then we come home and it just, you know, it, the, the, the magnitude of the diagnosis just hits us. And um, having a psychosocial program uh, is, is really helpful. So if you tell your provider, you can ask them, you know, your oncologist, is there a psychosocial program that exists um, and does it provide therapy or a psychologist or a psychiatrist? Um, that individual can, um, you, you can get a re referral for a psychosocial program and then they can see you every, every, every um, few weeks or, or however, uh, however um, I think every two weeks to every four weeks and sometimes, sometimes a little bit further apart. Um, it's important if you're newly diagnosed to, to get that referral in early because sometimes um, there can be a, a delay. So the big takeaway from uh, a delay in terms of wait lists. So uh, the big takeaway with regards to psychosocial is that it's not always brought up with patients and um, it's a good idea to inquire about it um, because uh, you can potentially, depending on your center, depending on your center, uh, get free therapy. Uh, which is uh, pretty pretty massive uh, when you think about all the different uh, things that cancer can <laughs> cancer can throw your way. Um, what about mental ability? So um, trauma can affect individuals. It can affect families. It can affect cultures and communities. If you think about the inter intergenerational trauma with the um, uh, with the with the uh, indigenous residential school system, for example, um, it can also affect service providers. So you can think about the trauma that they have experienced seeing patients, for example, that they've gotten close to um, pass away or or go through a lot of suffering. Um, but the important thing to think about here is that um, cancer is also a going through cancer is a traumatic experience, whether it's an early stage or a late stage cancer, it's a traumatic experience. Um, and it's, it's tough for both the survivors and individuals and the teal sisters and, uh, the supporters as well. So what does that mean? Um, trauma can in impact our nervous system. It can impact our ability to, to regulate our emotions. So our fight, flight, or freeze response. Um, it can affect, again, our emotional regulation, our ability to stabilize. Uh, it can then have an impact on our physical and mental health and our relationships, even our connection to spirituality and community. And uh, therefore, it has a lot of different impacts on different areas of our life. So physical health, mental health, 
relationships, community, et cetera. So um, one thing, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because um, instead of having the question, what's wrong with me? or as to why am I behaving in this way, or if you're, um, or if you're receiving the questions, what's wrong with you, et cetera. Um, maybe you can also think of yourself as someone who has gone through a traumatic experience. And it takes much, much longer to um, heal from that trauma than it does to just kind of um, get a, a, a few cycles of chemo. If you're somebody who is on chemo for life, then that is also something where um, you can also very much understand that this is also a very, very traumatic experience as well. Um, so understanding that um, and, and giving yourself self-compassion is very important here. Um, trauma, mental health in general is very stigmatized. Um, so you can, again, think of um, the phrase, what's wrong with me? And you can change it to what's ha what happened to me. And the what happened to me question will help you kind of deconstruct um, what happened, why is it traumatic, and what can you do now about it. Um, it will also give you some more awareness about your own mental health needs, no matter um, how mental health is a spectrum. Um, so no matter how good your mental health is at any one point in time, it can get better. And um, you, again, it's a good idea to understand how to communicate your, your needs as well. So I've provided a quote here that um, some people experience nausea because of anxiety, for example. So they, they experience anxiety and then they get nauseous. But what? let's say you are experiencing nausea and you're worried that it's related to a recurrence. Um, and how do you communicate that? You can say that, look, a lot of my nausea is related to anxiety, but I'm not feeling anxious right now. And my nausea is higher than normal. So that's a way to be able to communicate that, um, look, this is a this is a different kind of, of symptom and, uh, and that will help your provider basically identify that. Um, I'm gonna preface this by saying that of course, um, you know, that education has to happen on both sides. The providers also have to get that education about how to identify these things as well, but um, we're doing education um, for, uh, we're doing patient education today. Um, a big trauma response is a, a fight or flees resp response. So um, sometimes when you're in an appointment, you might freeze um, and you may completely not understand what the provider is telling you. So therefore having a notebook with questions and a spot for answers again is useful and then having somebody with you. Um, also, one of the questions could be, if I have questions later, who can I contact? And that way you will feel peace of mind that when the physician gets up and leaves or when the pharmacist gets up and leaves, you'll know who you can contact if you have more questions. Um, speaking of questions, <laughs> um, we're now at the end of the presentation. So uh, I just wanted to say it's it's great uh, meeting all of you. I, I hope I'm running kind of on time and um, I would entertain any questions at, uh, at this time. All right. Thank you so much. This was a really fabulous presentation. Um, so lots of questions are coming into the chat. So I'm just going to try to group a few together and uh, and see what we get through here. So um, you did mention at one point that sometimes you've noticed oncologists are not comfortable discussing clinical trials. Um, so someone's just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it really depends on the oncologist. I won't um, put, paint everyone in uh, in a same brush, brush. There are some oncologists who feel very comfortable discussing the results of clinical trials. So to, to give you an idea, um, I was very, um, I, I wanted to talk about, you know, survival curves and uh, and like data on you know patient populations and and the the you know whether a study a small study could be taken seriously or not um so i was looking at myself from the perspective of a provider as well mm -hmm. so i i don't know how many providers would feel comfortable talking to another person who is a patient but is also you know trying to analyze herself as a provider sure there are also some some who, you know, um, a, a very small minority who may not feel comfortable talking because they're used to a more 
you know, top down type of relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I actually feel more optimistic. I feel that most are not in like completely on that extreme right now. Um, but, uh, but again, systemic changes do, do take time to, to kind of roll out. Absolutely. Uh, okay. So, uh, the first question that came in was how do you deal with paternalistic attitudes when you don't want to anger your doctor? It's a big question. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm really putting the, the speakers on the spot today. <laughs> yeah, I know. This, it's, it's a really good question. Um, and um, I, you know, it's, it's a tough question. And um, if, if you have an option to find another provider, if, if you're getting into that level of paternalistic attitudes, it, like you have, you have your, you're right to. Um, so don't let, don't be kind of put in a, in a corner um, if you can that way, um, if you do have access to other providers. If you don't, um, the best thing that I can tell you is I'm sorry that this is happening to you. Um, first, this is a result of a system that is still has not moved forward. Um, in in certain situations, um, I would really take like reserve that time half an hour prior to that appointment or an hour prior to that appointment to um, think about the questions that you have um, and think about um, you know how you are going to communicate your values and your priorities. Yeah, um, and really also think about how you're going to reduce, calm down your fight and freeze response, which is a very natural response to have as well, because the paternalistic attitude can also be mentally uh, tough for mental health. Sure. Um, so taking that time before is helpful. Um, also having somebody with you who will have your back. Um, that can be very helpful if even if it's like a COVID outbreak, you can also have somebody over the phone um, who, you know, really has your back. Um, a family doctor, getting a referral from a family doctor is uh, is particularly helpful as well. Um, or or another physician who um, you know that this physician is going to take seriously. <laughs> yeah. um, that that can sometimes be helpful. But I do feel sad mentioning these um mentioning these responses because really it shouldn't be your responsibility to do that. Um, but um, this is just an unfortunate situation where uh, these are just some, some tips to maneuver around the system. Yeah, no, oh, it's, it's very good advice. Um, I'm going to kind of bring two questions together with this one. So um, someone's written, how exactly would someone change their oncologist if they like one more than the other? We don't choose one at the outset. So it never occurred to me that we could switch. Would there be a conversation with one's GP? And then the other question under that is, how do I go about asking for a second opinion? I'm worried it will affect my standard of care. So I think we're kind of looking at the same question, same themes there. Yeah, so um, so there sometimes there is a, a patient engagement or like some a patient feedback or, or some kind of a phone number that you can contact about that. Um, sometimes the patient support line can be also helpful because the nurses do not have that level, that kind of bias. And you can kind of, um, you can kind of say that, you know, I would prefer switching to a different oncologist. How do I, how do I move around that? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, those two are, are good options. Mm -hmm. Um, second opinions are, are a little bit more challenging. Um, so you can ask the patient a support line as to, as to whether another physician is available for a second uh, a second opinion. Um, somebody has written in the chat about Cancer Connect uh, Canada, which might, might be helpful. Um, sometimes when people are deciding whether to move from one center to another center in the same city, or that is in a neighboring city, they can sometimes get a referral and, and another physician can kind of review the documentation that way as well. Um, I know that's not really that helpful, um, but it, it is a tough one with regards to second opinions. Um, but I would start with your um, patient support line as well as 
um, any any kind of external agency like uh, like Cancer Connect it would would also be helpful too. Okay, and what about the conversation with someone's um, GP? Do you think that is something yeah? So, so we, oh, the the one thing I forgot to mention is that not all oncologists. Um, so gynecologists are a specific type of oncologist. Mm -hmm. um, there are other types of oncologists that treat breast cancer, other types that treat gastro, um, like GI cancers, et cetera. So not every oncologist is the same. Um, so really you're looking for a gynecologist. Um, a family doctor can sometimes be useful. Um, particularly when I was looking for a family doctor, I was also looking for someone who had experience treating cancer patients or had worked in the hospital setting um, with cancer patients at some point. Sometimes that is a very, very difficult, uh, very, very difficult thing to find though. Um, family doctors can sometimes be helpful. You can bring this up with your family doctor. There's no harm. Um, if they have experience um, working in that kind of, so some family doctors have done like rotations in the hospital, or they have basically done some kind of uh, relief shifts in the hospital, and they may they may have some contacts, and and that that is particularly helpful. But usually, it would be within your cancer center. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're out of time. Um, I know there's some more questions. So again, apologies, we couldn't get to all of them, but I want to thank you so much, Shaliza, for helping us bridge that gap between the, the patient and the healthcare provider. You've given some awesome tips and some really great insights. Uh, so thank you for being with us and thanks for everyone for all the great questions. And that wraps up our first half of this evening.